Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Climate Brawl debate. This is the 29th of October, 2022. It is uh, 7 p.m. in Paris, where I'm sitting, and uh, good morning or good afternoon to the Americans. Um, so the United Nations 27th Conference of the Parties was recently held in Egypt, and it showed a renewed interest in the subject of climate change and climate science in general. And then is the debate settled, as the IPCC suggests, and the peer review science um, suggests, or is peer review just another word for bell review? Uh, should we uh, move towards energy sources that are based on low emissions? Is fossil fuels killing the environment or an overall benefit for mankind? Or is it just about politics and money? So these are the questions that we will be exploring today. Um, the person arguing in favor of the motion is Gerald Kutney. Um, Gerald is an elected fellow of the Royal Canadian uh, Geographical Society. He's a former adjunct professor at the University of North, uh, Northern British Columbia, and he taught the, the uh, global um, after graduate course on climate change and global warming. He has presented several uh, guest lectures at Carleton University on climate change denial. And in early 2019, Gerald took the initiative to launch the hashtag climate, climate brawl on Twitter to confront uh, climate deniers with head on with facts, signs and arguments. So Gerald has disproven the skeptics hypothesis that climate change believers or advocates are not prepared to debate or listen to count arguments. Uh, then we have a um, person arguing in, uh, against the motion is Tony Heller. Tony is a member of the CO2 coalition. He's a geologist, a teacher, verification engineer, and he hosts a uh, contrarian uh, uh, website, realclimatescience.com, alongside his two very cute dogs. Uh, Topo, Toto pulls back the curtain. Um, Tony also hosts a YouTube channel where he regularly tries to deconstruct the climate change narrative. And according to Tony, global warming is indeed man-made. It's man-made by Michael Mann and James Hansen, but it has nothing to do with climate or science. So, gentlemen, welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good, good, good so, to be here. Uh, yeah. The debate's going to start. Gerald's going to start with, the, um, with his opening statement, and then uh, Tony will uh, take it from there. Off well, to you, Gerald. Thank you for setting this up. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I enjoy, always enjoy going back into the den of denial and have a climate brawl. And so this is a special opportunity for me. But I do have a small protest to make before we get started. You know, both you and Tony are against the science of climate change. And then there's me. I, of course, support the science of climate change. I accept it. And in my view, that's it's very unfair. It's not unfair to me. It's unfair to you. Why is that? Because I have all of science on my side and you have none. You guys can't win this debate. You can't. What does the science actually say about modern climate change? The accepted science states that climate change is a threat to us now, and it's going to get worse. It's caused by us, especially from the burning of fossil fuels. And we need to take action now to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Well, who supports that science? The peer review literature does, virtually all of it. Every major scientific organization in the world and the IPCC and other expert reviews of the science. Well, who disagrees with this science? That is the climate deniers, such as Tony and my opponents here tonight. And I presume a lot of his followers do as well. They're listening to this climate brawl broadcast. Am I going to be able to convert anyone that's listening today that they should change their spots? I don't think so, but I plan to try. And so thank you for setting this up and let's get this climate brawl growing. All right, great for that. Tony, off to you. Yeah, I, I appreciate Gerald uh, coming here and doing this. I've been trying to get someone to take his position in a debate for years um, with no luck. I've had several people agree and then at the last minute they um, cancel so gerald and, uh, has shown up and he's articulated his position very really clearly and um, i appreciate that it's, it's good to have the opportunity to do this um, I, 
there's lots of scientists who um, disagree with what he said, and there's there's lots of peer review literature which disagrees with Gerald's position. Um, what we have is sort of monopoly on information from his side. From his side, the newspapers have generally made a decision several years ago that they will not present any skeptical points of view. Um, until recently, Twitter engaged in similar things. I was banned from Twitter, uh, they said, for posting misinformation, when in fact it was well-documented, accurate information. And I think Elon Musk is actually about to release documentation about the censorship, which went on at Twitter um, prior to um, his purchase of it. Um, so it, it's good that it's good that now that Twitter is opening up to we're gonna have a more even exchange of ideas and and actually uh, climate scam has been trending on Twitter recently, which is really nice. To see, that's something that never could have happened before. But there, there's lots and lots of science. I'm a scientist myself. Um, I was first introduced to the global warming idea while working at Los Alamos in around 1980. And I was a true believer for many years, uh, for decades, until I started looking into the data myself and started looking at the historical record. And I realized there was a lot of misinformation being presented. And in fact, incomprehensibly bad misinformation was being presented over and over again in support of, of the idea that we were headed towards a climate disaster. So I started talking about it. I started blogging about it. And um, now I've made tens of thousands of blog posts documenting the historical record, documenting alteration of, of climate data, and um, just showing that the story that people keep hearing has very little to do with reality. Well, in response to that, the first point you brought up about lots of scientists who disagree, and there's lots of peer-reviewed papers that challenge the accepted science. I am certainly not aware of that. The amount of climate scientists that disagree, and there are some, there are a handful, at the most a dozen or so, their names are well known, that we both know very well. You have to re realize that in the peer-reviewed literature, just taking the AR6, for example, the IPCC, there was only 30,000 peer-reviewed studies. How many contrarian studies have actually been peer-reviewed? A couple dozen? You can scrape and try to find a few more, but there's nothing in comparison. Science is not determined by the odd paper that slips through peer review. Peer review is the, let's call it the early step of quality control for science. But then what happens when a peer paper gets out, the scientific community has to judge whether it has an impact or not. I can assure everyone that's watching today, if a peer reviewed paper comes out that shows that climate change does not exist, that's not caused by us, not only would it, that person win a Nobel prize, but the whole world would be happy if that happened. I would be happy if that happened. Nobody wants to see climate change come about. It's a scary situation. The only reason that science promotes it is they're trying to warn us of the dangers that are ahead to try to stop it before it gets worse. Well, actually the, the climate change uh, scare industry is a, a massive industry. Uh, it's a multi-trillion dollar industry at this point. And there's lots and lots of people, particularly in academia and other industries, who, who depend on fear of climate change for their living. Um, so I would completely disagree with you. There are lots and lots of people who would be extremely unhappy um, if their hypothesis was um, undermined. Um, a good example, uh, going back to 1993, when Al Gore first um, entered the vice presidency, a good friend of mine, Dr. Bill Gray, who's now who passed away in 2016, uh, professor at Colorado State University. He was considered the world's leading tropical meteorologist. 
and um, the, he's the person who invented modern hurricane forecasting. He got a call from Al Gore, who invited him to come to a global warming conference in, in Washington. Bill is a very polite, congenial guy. He, he told Al Gore that he would be happy to attend the conference, but, but he wanted the vice president to know that he wasn't a big fan of his global warming theories. And um, Al Gore got very offended by this. And uh, Bill Gray had, had received funding for decades from NOAA every year for his research. He never got another penny out of the government for as long as he lived after he was blackballed. And this is it's pretty common knowledge in academia that if you don't go along with what the, the funding agencies, what the politicians want, you're not going to get funding. So, so the, the, the peer reviewed literature is heavily biased by, by funding. And this is exactly what President Eisenhower warned about in his farewell address in 1961. He talked about the dangers of how um, research was being taken over by the government and how there was this very real danger that public policy would be captured by a scientific and technological elite which is exactly what we've seen happen. Um, the government has pushed a particular agenda through funding. And now the, now we have a few people like Michael Mann who are very vocal and, and they're influencing policy in, in a very distorted fashion. So I, I just want to read a question here, and I suppose it's, it's related to you, uh, Gerald, from the audience. And they ask, um, why do climate alarmists uh, get so mad over good news about climate, such, for example, polar bear numbers are down, barrier reef coral grows, et cetera, a lot. Um, I see deaths from natural disasters have come down. Now, I, I know there's a dispute in, in, in the way people interpret the data, but, you know, isn't there also good news that's come from a warming planet? Uh, let's put two things quickly together here. One is the use of the term climate alarmist, which I believe is related to Tony's scare industry. The only people that use those terms and that essentially insult the scientists that work in this area are climate denialists. Scare industry? You have tens of thousands of the leading climate experts around the world trying to warn us to protect us of dangers that are coming at us because of what climate change is bringing. Scare industry? What they're doing is, is a protection industry. And if people don't realize that, they have no idea what science is really about. In the question that's asked, I do enjoy any good story about the climate that comes around. The problem is most of it is very misleading or exaggerating. Polar bears are up. That's a true statement. Hunting bands have been a major reason for that, but the reason almost doesn't matter. The important thing is that they are up. The coral reef is a very is much more disputed than some of the propaganda you see about it. The UN is now looking, UNESCO is looking at it to make it a protected site. And so again, I don't wanna get argue or individual things. There are anything that's good news about the climate is fine, but you have to be careful about what is the net influence of climate change. No respectable scientists in the world will say that the net benefit of CO2 into the atmosphere that we have right now is a benefit. It is just the opposite. So you can come up with a few small things that may or may not be true. Let's assume they are true. They're nowhere close to making up for all the problems that climate change is, is causing. Um, in, in 1920, um, Scientific American ran an article um, showing the tremendous benefit to crop growth of by pumping industrial carbon dioxide over growing crops. Um, they called it carbon dioxide fertilization. And that, that was a very big topic on 120. In 1921, um, a German scientist described, said the greatest um, threat facing humanity was the inability to grow enough food. And he said a, the very simple way to fix this is by increasing the amount of carbon dioxide which would greatly enhance crop yields. And that's exactly what we've seen over the last century. Crop yields are up like five or 10 X. Um, NASA has done studies showing how the planet has gotten much greener over the last few decades as carbon dioxide has increased. 
So hum humanity has benefited tremendously from the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We have 8 billion people now and the ability to feed them um, is largely due to the, what Scientific American described as carbon dioxide fertilization back in 1920. So this isn't a term that was, I've heard the term carbon dioxide fertilization being um, angrily argued against and blamed on, on climate deniers, um, as they'd say, like me. But it's actually a term that was invented by Scientific American in, in the year 1920. Um, there's very little evidence that carbon dioxide has had any bad effects and lots of evidence that it's had good effects. Um, you sent me a link for a couple of days ago about the position from the Geologic Society of America as to why they um, why they were supporting this position of, of climate alarm. And I, I'm going to make a video later today showing how every single thing in their position is, is incorrect. But one of the claims they're making is that there's been declining snow cover um, in the world. And that's not true. It's the exact opposite. In fact, um, snow cover right now in the northern hemisphere is at a record high for this time of year. I, I can look out the I, I spent a couple of hours this morning shoveling the snow in my driveway here in Wyoming. And snow cover has been increasing during the um, autumn and winter, which is when the snow falls. And it's not only the extent of snow cover that's been increasing, but also the volume of snow. They're both, they've both been increasing over time. And this is because cold Arctic air has been intruding further and further south. The United States is getting more, um, the area of snow covered in the United States is larger than it was um, 30 or 40 years ago now. So a, a lot of the claims that are made about snow cover, about ice, about sea level rise are, are simply incorrect. And it's disturbing to see that a supposedly respectable organization like the Geological Society of America making these claims without actually checking the data to see if they're true. And from, I know a lot of members of the Geologic Society of America. I'm, I'm a geologist myself. I don't know of any individual geologists who support that position other than Michael Mann. And yet the, the organization takes positions without actually consulting their members. So um, Tony, I want to ask you, it's a question from, from the audience. They ask, can you please explain what kind of data you have found that contradicts the, the major scientific resources? Because, um, you know, th this is a point that I, that I think is sometimes valid is, are you effectively saying that the peer reviewed sources or the, the published papers, the IPCC, they're either biased or they Machiavellian or they just, you know, shills for the, for the narrative? I suppose well, that's implicit in that question. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the peer review academia is severely biased by the funding process, which more or less demands that they produce a particular result. Uh, so, yes, I, I don't have a lot of respect for peer review, but one of the things I've done extensively is to go through and look through predictions that have been made by people in academia and see how they failed over time. A very good, good example is with Arctic sea ice back around 2007. There was a flurry of predictions that Arctic sea ice was about to disappear, including at the Nobel Prize ceremony, which was all, almost exactly 15 years ago, when Al Gore cited a study from the Navy and other organizations saying that the Arctic was likely to be ice free by the year 2014. And there's actually more Arctic sea ice now than there was when he made that prediction 15 years ago. So, so I've done this over and over again. James Hansen in 2008, the guy who started the global warming scare before Congress in 1988, predicted that the Arctic would be ice free between 2013 and 2018. And once again, that's wrong. We, there's more Arctic sea ice now than there was then. And I've gone through over and over again and shown how these predictions that have been made by academics, academics have not turned out to be correct. But, so, but I've been talking for a long time, so should Gerald. So but before I read the next question, I want you to maybe respond to that, Gerald. Um, what do you say to, to those of us who are saying, look, the scientists have been crying wolf? Um, well, maybe not the scientists always, but the activists per se. And, and why isn't the scientists holding guys like Al Gore with these absurd predictions, um, if you agree with them, to account? You know? I'm not quite sure Al Gore made absurd predictions. We're talking about science here. 
We're talking about an international scientific community that represents tens of thousands of leading researchers in the world. And tied into this, just on Tony's comment, when you're choosing a side and the world is against you, the leading experts, the leading organizations are against you, the bulk of the publications, in the, for example, in this case, in the peer-reviewed literature are against you, how, how do you argue that? Well, the only thing you can do is say they're corrupt. They've been bought. They're going after grants. They don't know what they're talking about. It's an absurd position to take. That's the position you take when you've already lost the argument. I would like to talk about a little bit about the greening effect, which Tony mentioned the whole pile of things. And being old, I probably forgot about half of them by now. So Tony, if I forget some, just bring them back up. Let's take a greening effect, which uh, Tony loves quoting a century old articles. Science does move on. A lot of those articles are related to the use of CO2 in actual greenhouses. And they did some field experiments otherwise as well. But if I remember the Scientific American paper, it was basically about greenhouses. Uh, the atmosphere is not a greenhouse. And so it's not exactly the same, but it's not an important point enough to argue over. He talked about the five to tenfold increase in food, food generation and in crops. That is one of the most misleading connections I've ever heard of in my life. No one has ever implied that that almost had anything to do with CO2. That has to do with improved fertilization and the crop protection and seed crops. There's no way CO2 gives you five to 10 times production from the puny amount that's gone into the air. It's a ridiculous statement. And so when you have a, a statement to make and you have to go to newspaper headlines or you have to go to century old publications that's going on, I think we should try to stay in the modern world. Science advances over time. And I'm not aware of any science that's been published that supports what Tony has been saying. So, yeah, so, um, you asked a good question there, Gerald. So um, how I came to arrive in, in this sort of thinking. So I, I think a lot of it might go back to when I was in, in attending university in the 1970s. I was studying geology at Arizona State University. And, and one of my geology professors was Dr. Robert Dietz, who was one of the key people um, who discovered uh, provided information about seafloor spreading. Um, back more over 100 years ago, um, Alfred uh, Wegener um, presented a hypothesis that continents moved called continental drift. And it was soundly, the evidence was overwhelming that this was occurring. He could look at sediments on the east coast of South America and the west coast of Africa and see that there was the layers of rock lined up. They had the same fossils in them. They were the same age. Um, you can any child looking at a map, globe, map a globe, can see that the continents kind of fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. But the scientific community refused to accept this for decades. From for, for like six or seven decades, there was tremendous resistance to this idea that the continents could move. And the reason was because they couldn't explain the mechanism for it. So they just rejected the obvious for it. So Dr. Dietz talked about this a lot, and how he, he, he was just fighting against the, the overwhelming consensus of the scientific community. Even though the science was overwhelming, it was obvious, it was very logical, and any child could understand it. Um, and eventually, he, he was one of the key players in convincing the scientific community that continents do move. Um, so the, I became aware of the fact at the time that the scientific community was very resistant to the idea of change. They get an idea, they get a consensus, and, and they don't want to change it. Galileo faced this hundreds of years ago. Um, I, I grew up in Los Alamos. My father is a nuclear physicist, and I saw this all the time. In, in Los Alamos, so it was very it was very hard to get a new idea across. People would angrily argue against uh, new ideas um, just because they were different. It wasn't what they were. It was what it isn't what they were taught in college. It wasn't what they were taught to believe. 
Einstein met a tremendous amount of resistance. There was a, a pamphlet written, 100 Scientists Against Einstein. And, and he said, if, if, they're, if I'm wrong, why don't they just have one scientist explain it? Why do they need 100 to write a pamphlet? Yes, I wanna, um, sorry, just to ask you the next um, question that's been on the screen, um, sort of ties into okay. it. I, I um, see. You, you keep using the term denial. You know, what does denial basically have to do with the scientific process? And um, my understanding just of the word denial is it's, it's an attempt to conflate people who doubt climate science or global warming, if you will, with Holocaust denial. And, and it has to be said that two of the prominent climate skeptics, Stephen Koonin and Richard Lindzen, are Jewish and have both had lost family in the Holocaust, you know? So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's absurd to call them deniers, right? Uh, can I return to that after I answer, Tony? And don't let me forget sure. if I do, because I'll gladly answer your question. Uh, uh, I look forward to answering that. As I mentioned before, a, a typical strategy of climate deniers is, is, is to call all the legitimate sources corrupt. The other common strategy is to deflect. Bring up something that's a straw man that has nothing to do with climate science, such as, oh, this other brand of science, they were really awful in the past and, and they did horrible things. So therefore all science can be susceptible to these nasty things that happened in the past. Or as Tony brought up, look what happened to poor Galileo. Galileo was a victim of science denialism through the inquisition of the church. He, if you talk about Einstein and the infamous book of the 100 authors, those 100 authors were written by science deniers. And so what Tony has actually given is some of the worst examples of science denialism that's happened in history. Now let's go on to the comment that's what is a climate denier, et cetera. A climate den science denialism has been around since science has been around. Climate denialism is one of the more recent brands, the most famous one that's taken place. And it, the answer, what is a climate denier? is someone that denies the accepted science of climate change. I outlined the very simple basic features of what that, what, what that science is. And so a climate denier says, why well, don't believe you? They may show a graph that they picked up from a climate denier trash site. They may say, well, I can do it by common sense. A favorite one is that Oh, I've been, I've been researching this. I've been looking at Google for years. So I know way better than any of those climate experts do. They're wrong. The one thing I strongly object to, okay, we're kidding around a little bit here and having some fun. Holocaust denier associating with climate denier is absolutely wrong. And it's just a dirty trick that climate deniers bring up to try to shame those that are defending science. Who came, who was the first person to talk about denial in science? It was Galileo. Who was the first person to actually do science about denial? Which means the fear of the truth that you're willing to deny it. It was Sigmund Freud. I don't think Fritz Sigmund Freud was referring to the Holocaust. And it was daughter, his daughter that actually wrote a book about it. Now denial is an accepted syndrome within the psychological field. It's well known, there's papers on it and everything else. So please don't come up with some false accusation that there's any association between Holocaust and climate denialism. It's just a sham by the climate denial community to exploit the Holocaust to attack those that protect science? Uh, well, first, first of all, I'm a Jew and I find it extremely offensive. And I know that the initial use of the term climate denier was directly linked to Holocaust denial. There was never any question that that was the intent. But getting back to the, um, uh, the thing about peer review, so, Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, you know, the most respected medical journal in the world, wrote a paper recently, The, the Case Against Science. He said the case against science is clear. So that 
much of the scientific literature, as much as 50 percent, it's numbers probably actually higher, is is incorrect. And he and he listed the reasons why people why there's so much bad peer reviewed science out there right now. A lot of it has to do with money, um, but it also has to do with just following popular memes that people that science academics get caught up in popular ideas, things that can get them publicity, things that can bring them money. And there's other, actually the editor of another medical journal, I forgot which one, made a similar statement that you can't trust medical research anymore because it's been corrupted by money. You know, and we see the same thing in climate, in the climate industry, as I mentioned with Dr. Bill Gray, and I know lots of other academics um, who, who've suffered similar fates. I communicate with them every day. People who've lost, academics who've lost jobs because they took a position going up against this gigantic climate industrial complex. So I, I completely disagree with the argument Gerald's making. And I, I don't, I document very clearly the alterations of data, the incorrect information being made by government agencies. Um, Gerald keeps saying I'm a conspiracy theorist. I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm documenting misbehavior by people. This is what any investigator does. Like if you have a crime scene investigator, he goes and looks at the evidence and comes up with a theory about how the crime was committed and who committed it. And then the prosecutor presents it in court. So every, almost every trial, um, criminal trial is the prosecutor presenting a conspiracy theory. And if, if a defense attorney just said, came blurted out, that's just conspiracy theory, the judge isn't going to take him very seriously. and It's not going to allow him to t follow that, that line of argument. Because what I'm doing is I'm presenting evidence of wrongdoing. So to just try to write it off as conspiracy theory is not a very compelling argument. To go back to the question about the peer-reviewed literature, the medical journal situation, I must see that five or six times a week. And it just goes back to my statement before, typical deflection of climate deniers who don't want to talk about climate change, so they're desperate to find some other thing to blame. Let's say there's a hint of truth of what was said generally about the climate, about the peer-reviewed literature. How many journals have got rid of peer review? I'm not aware of too many. I do accept that peer review is not perfect. It's not meant to be perfect. But what's the alternative? Oh yeah, people can turn out their own, their own YouTube videos and say anything they want. Uh, that doesn't work too well because then you have no scrutiny whatsoever. So it's okay to criticize peer review, but it's important to, if you're going to replace it, have some suggestions how to do that. You brought up the case of your, 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 your friend, Professor Gray, who couldn't get his papers published. There's only one reason that people cannot get their pu papers published in peer review. They can't pass the scrutiny of peer review. There is not an international global sit set of journals where people say, oh, Dr. Gray is blacklisted. Whatever he sends to me, I'm going to put in the garbage bin because I don't like what he has to say. That's rubbish. The only people would say that don't understand how the scrutiny of, of peer review works, what the strength of it is. And again, I stand firmly behind this. If tomorrow, if anyone, including you, Tony, have proof that climate denial is, or sorry, climate science is wrong, you will be treated and applauded for that. When you turn out a YouTube video and you flash up, here is a a temperature from NASA that says the temperature was whatever. And then they changed it. And the point drops by a degree or wherever you show on your video. And then you come out and say, that is corruption. These are horrible people at NASA. They're trying to cheat us. First of all, the suggestion is absurd. It's, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever and say, yes, when you put up data, and I presume it's right, I don't know, I haven't checked it out, but presuming the data is correct, NASA is quite transparent. They say why they change information. They sometimes do change data sets for better reasons. 
there is a whole page on why there is adjustments to the scientific data. But then somebody comes out and said, no, that's not true. You're corrupt. Yes, that is a conspiracy theory. Uh, let, let me give you an analogy, Gerald. So I, I'm a software guy. I started out as a hardware guy, and I, I, got, I got my master's degree in electrical engineering, worked as a hardware guy for a long time. Now I do software um, professionally. Um, one of the great advances which has occurred in software, which has made software much better, is open source software, which people started putting their software out on the Internet. Anyone could see it, can review it, can enhance it. And this has caused a huge improvement in the software industry. Um, for example, the operating system Linux appeared about um, 30 years ago. And it, it's, it's tremendously advanced operating systems. Most engineering firms do their work on Linux now. I do most of my work on Linux. And it's because it was open source. It was, it was publicly available. It wasn't behind, it wasn't hidden. And so people were able to look at it, analyze it, and draw their own conclusions and improve it. And the same thing's true. We, we've got seen a similar revolution in, in information of other types, like about science and climate. I put my information out there so everyone in the world can look at it, they can analyze it, they can review it. Academics can do it if they want. Government people can do it if they want. Anyone with access to the internet can review it. So I think that an open source peer review is a much better idea than behind um, inside the ivory tower, behind paywalls. It's very hard to get peer reviewed papers because you generally have to pay for them. Um, and so the, the open source view of science to me is a tremendous improvement over the old closed source, hidden, opaque process of peer review. And as far as Dr. Gray goes, um, he wasn't blocked from publishing papers. He just didn't get funding. He had to self-fund his work. He self-funded his students, like Phil Klotzbeck. He funded Phil Klotzbeck out of his own pocket, and now Phil Klotzbeck runs the Colorado State University um, uh, hurricane forecast. Um, and, and and when Bill Gray died, I mean, when Bill Gray died in in uh, 2016. The obituaries were tremendous. Even the Weather Underground, which is tremendously, is an alarmist site. They they heaped huge amounts of praise on him as being a brilliant contributor to tropical meteorology. The New York Times praised him very heavily. So the suggestion that Bill Gray was in disgrace was simply not true. He just was blackballed from getting funding from government agencies. And as President Eisenhower warned in 1961, government agencies have taken over the funding process, which has made it inherently political. And that's a very interesting conspiracy theory. Again, we can add it to the list. When you talk about the peer review process, I think you're suggesting is we shouldn't have peer review. People should be able to just submit an article to a journal and it would be published. That I actually don't even know the proper words to describe it. It's, it's absurd. It would cause knowledge chaos. Let's well, pretend if I may um, just come in there, wasn't that how the scientific method worked before post-World War II? I mean, Albert Einstein published in an open review journal. He only had one peer reviewed in his life. Before 1950, most science wasn't done in peer review. So, so I, I understand you defending the methodology and the integrity of peer reviewed and this something to be said. I've been thankful for peer review myself. Um, in, in, I do it in the private sector. We don't do it in published journals, but it, it occurs among engineers. But isn't you know what Tony is saying that the, 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 the peer review is being put on a too high a pedestal? I guess that's the critique. And yeah. after we get to that, I would like to move to the debate in a, in a different it's, direction, if you don't mind. It's a fair comment that peer review has not existed in the history of science. Uh, certainly, from I guess around the middle of the 19th century to up to about World War II. When scientific journals were coming out, uh, I believe this is true that a lot of the, what's it called, the editing of, of such journals, they were not open. Any nutcase cannot simply sit, send in a paper and, and publish it by the Royal Society or any internationally well known journal. That has never existed. 
Well, where did the editorials come from? Who was doing the reviewing? The editors of these journals were very highly respected and generally considered some of the top men in their field. And they were still strict reviewing themselves. And so, but that is the past. When you look at today, when you look at uh, peer review, you're talking, take Twitter, for example, our favorite topic that Tony and I deal with a lot, you do as well. There's no peer reviews, nothing on there. I've been dealing with climate denialism on Twitter for a decade. I actually had my anniversary yesterday. So you can, you can say congratulations if you want. It is bloody chaos up there. 90% of the stuff I deal with is pure garbage. If that garbage went into the peer review journal, it would be a joke. So please, I have no problem with people saying how to improve peer review, but you throw peer review out of the window and you just have chaos out there. I want to ask you um, this question from the audience, so if we can close the peer review debate, you know, for now. Um, it's a question for you, Gerald. Um, Stephen Coonan, you know, he recently wrote a book called Unsettled, the um, Signs of Climate Change. And um, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but what errors did he make in reviewing the IPC reports and finding them inconsistent with the alarm that you and I suppose others are promoting? I'll be frank. I don't care what Steve Coonan said about the IPC reviews. I don't care about what any contrarian says about the IPCC reviews. Kuninen's not a, a climate scientist. He's in no position. What he does in his book, which is not peer reviewed, is to give his opinion. It's just like the other contrarian books. Well, wait, Steve, Stephen Kuhnen is one of the pioneers of computer modeling. Good and for he's him. A, he's a, he's no, a he, physicist. He's not an expert in, in the climate sciences. The point I'm trying to make whether it's, it's Kuninen or it's one of the contrarians, and some of them are climate scientists, by the way, if they have an objection to what's been published or they have new evidence, they can do it in the peer review literature. If they are so scared of the peer review process that they would never pass the scrutiny, that is their problem. The way accepted science works, when accepted science for the general scientific community, it will remain accepted until new evidence suggests otherwise, if ever. People's opinions on the peer reviewed literature are not valid. Those opinions don't mean anything. The literature from the IPCC, all they're doing is reviewing and assessing the already peer reviewed literature. Their assessments are done by dozens upon dozens of the leading climate scientists in the world. So somebody, even though he, is, he has an education, I agree he has a PhD, he certainly has a right to his opinion, but it's, it doesn't change anything. There's always opinions out there. It doesn't matter what, there's people that believe the moon is still made of cheese. Now they may have a, 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 peer, a paper that they can get to prove that in their minds, but who cares? Okay. Um, the audience is asking if we can move maybe a bit to debating the science, and I'll ask you the question this way, Tony. What is your main dispute with the um, global warming science as it stands? Well, we keep hearing that there's some sort of climate emergency, but, but if you look at the actual data uh, about crop yields, about death rates from weather events, um, or lots of other data, there's, there's really no evidence that there's anything bad going on. Life expectancy is at a record high, poverty is at a record low, malnutrition is at a record low, deaths from natural disasters are at a record low, illiteracy is at a record low. Every indication is that the human condition is the best now it's ever been, and it's been rapidly improving over the last 50 years. And when you compare that with the, all the claims that we're having a climate emergency, we, we, we keep hearing these claims. Millions of people are dying because of climate change. But when you look at the actual data, you see that death rates from, from weather events are way down. So that there's no support for these claims. So we're constantly bombarded with this propaganda that there's something horrible going on when all of the available evidence shows that the human condition is improving. 
In 1989, the United Nations said we only had 10 years to save the planet from global warming. In 2006, Al Gore said we only have 10 years to save the planet from global warming. Now, Alexandria Cortez says that. Joe Biden said that recently. We keep hearing this 10-year figure over and over again, and nothing seems to actually, the human condition keeps improving. So we're constantly bombarded with all this alarm from the press. They don't allow any other opinions to be presented. And none of what they're saying seems to be true. And if you look at actual data, like data for the United States, which has the best um, climate data in the world by far, best historical climate data, you can see that the heat waves, the, the very hot days have declined sharply in the United States since the 1930s. Um, there, if you look at data for hurricanes around the world, hurricanes have declined over the last 50 years. There's been no change in tropical cyclone frequency. Major hurricanes have declined sharply over the last 30 years. Severe tornadoes have declined in the United States sharply. You know, where is this evidence of the crisis that we keep hearing? Whenever I look at the actual data from official government sources, I don't see any evidence that a crisis actually exists. It looks to me like a media creation. It's, just, it's hysteria. It's mass hysteria trying to drive towards uh, energy policy. And, and that's really what this is all about. It's not, there's no such thing as climate policy, but we have as energy policy. And what the media has done is they've created this association between the burning of fossil fuels and bad weather. So when they talk about climate policy or they talk about climate change, what they're really talking about is fossil fuels. And at some point, we'll need to discuss the energy part of this, but I've probably used up my time at this point. But that's really what this is about, is energy rather than climate. Tony, are you talking about your graph that you've been showing the last couple of days on, on Twitter about the death rate declining? With time, well, yeah, that, I mean that's one of the graphs I use. Is that okay. is that the, the yes? You, you, I just wanted to make a point that I, you claim that that I don't know if I, I don't I don't yeah, Gerald, I, I don't know if it's just me or other people, but you keep cutting in and out. I'm not sure if it's a problem with the feed or with your. Oh, sorry. Can you, can, can you hear me now? I think it was you yeah. Tony, for a minute or so, but it should be fine. I'm seeing both okay. of you. Okay. Well, just going back to that graph, which you claimed to do the decreasing deaths from climate related yeah. uh, disasters. Uh, that wasn't quite true. That was part of it. It also included earthquakes. It also included volcanoes. But leave that aside. I've seen other graphs. Lomberg uses this sort of information all the time. The implication though, when people show these graphs of decreasing deaths from natural disasters, extreme weather, that therefore climate change doesn't cause extreme weather events. The science is pretty clear on this. this climate change has to do with changing climate, CO2 and greenhouse gases, global warming causes an increase in the frequency and severity of extreme weather events, that it gets lost in statistics that are so influenced by so many other factors, by early warning systems, by uh, better and safety measures and response times, better hospitalizations. It doesn't matter what all the factors that go into it is. But to say that that doesn't show that climate change is not making extreme weather worse it's, it may be true, but that's not what those stats are there for. If you're not aware of cl uh, climate change causing extreme weather events, you're not paying much attention to what's going on in the world. If you want to look at a report, the famous one from the IPCC is the SR15 report, which came out two or three years ago. They let out quite clearly what the threat is. I'm not aware of anything in the climate literature that says that global warming does not cause a problem and is a threat, and threat to life and to people. I'll give you an example that took place in Canada. Uh, in the summer of 2021, there was a massive heat dome that stuck over the northwest U.S. and over B.C. There was a small town in, in B.C. called Linton. The record temperature ever in Canada had been 
46 degrees. Over a three day period, every single day, that small town set a new Canadian record, ended up at 49.6 degrees Celsius in a town in Canada. The hottest temperature ever recorded at the 50th parallel. The next day that town burnt down, burnt to the ground. That's just a small example. There was the BC government said hundreds had died because of the heat wave. But for some reason, Tony can't see where there's any problem with any of this stuff. And what, what will climate deniers say? Well, that was a weather event. It had nothing to do with the climate. That is also why scientists do attribution studies that show the contribution of climate change when weather events do hit. Weather events are influenced by many factors. I agree with that. But by, by definition, that's what climate change is all about, though. Climate change is also a major factor. Um, so, so, for, so, yeah, so, so it ties in with the question, yeah, I guess, is what, what evidence would it take for you to reverse your opinion on climate change? I, I, I would prefer to just respond to what Gerald was saying okay. right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for, first of all, um, North Dakota, just across the border from Canada, reached the same temperature in 19, during the summer of 1936. Um, the world's, world's record temperature and the United States record temperature was set in 1913, 54 degrees Celsius. In 1859, Santa Barbara, California re was almost that hot caused by downslope winds. And that's what happened in British Columbia last year. They had downslope winds. So these Sirocco winds, these downslope winds causing extreme heating in a localized area is a phenomenon that's been going on for a long time, and it has nothing to do with climate change. This is a well-known meteorological phenomenon. Um, as far as death rates from natural disasters um, declining over the last century, um, they're down 95% from the 1920s. And in 19, I'm going to make a video about this later. In 1921, there was a tremendous drought and heat wave around the world, uh, which is very well documented. It was associated with a huge mass coronal injection in May 1921 from, from the sun. Um, tens of millions of people were facing starvation around the world. I've got a good ad from Save the Children from 1921, talking about the incredible suffering from this heat wave and drought. The heat wave and drought was all over Eastern Europe, um, Russia, and Asia. Um, so a lot of the deaths in 1920s were due to this incredible heat wave and drought. Prior to altering the, to NASA and NOAA altering the U.S. data, 1921 was the second hottest year on record in the United States. Um, there were lots of other terrible weather disasters in, in the, during the 1920s. 1925 was by far the deadliest tornado in U.S. history. The tri-state tornado struck a mile-wide path across three states and destroyed dozens of towns. I, I can, um, in 1927, the Red Cross described 1927 as being the worst disaster year in their history. The worst flooding in U.S. history occurred on um, the Mississippi River during 1927. Vermont had their worst flood in 1927. St. Louis was destroyed by a tornado during 1927. So the, this belief that extreme weather is getting worse is not based on the historical record. And as far as the theory of it goes, the global warming theory should reduce extreme weather, not increase it. Global warming is theory is based on the idea that the, the poles heat up faster than the equator. That reduces the temperature difference, which reduces Earth's heat engine and should, in response, reduce the amounts of extreme weather. On Venus, they have no temperature difference between the poles and the equator, and they have no weather at all on Venus because you need because the, the Earth's heat engine is driven by that temperature difference. So global warming should reduce the amounts of extreme weather not increase it on a theoretical basis. And we see this in the historical record shows the same thing. Here, I'll, and I'll answer the question too, just to let you know, but just to get back on Tony's point, uh, your rendition of old newspaper reports on weather across the US and wherever is, is quite interesting. 
what you're talking about, I have never heard any of that before. I'm not aware of any of this being science. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you can supply some peer review literature, what you're saying about what global warming should be doing to the world. It's strange that's to be polite for me. Now, this is actually tied into the question. The question is a good one. What specific evidence thinks CO2, oops, Oh, what would be a safe CO2 level and why? Sorry, I think I saw a question move back. Oh, yeah, sorry. The, the last question was, um, what specific evidence links uh, increase of CO2 to extreme weather? Global warming almost does it, essentially does it in principle. Uh, there's actually studies that have gone into it. There's lots of scientific papers, but what causes the changes in the weather? The journal global warming, increases the temperature, it increases the moisture content of the air, that causes a positive feedback, and so the temperature even increases more. The, by definition, that's going to disrupt climates in various parts of the world. Forget about the ice melting and the consequences of rising sea levels and stuff like that. That's another consequence of global warming. But that's why it's called climate change. You increase the temperature, that changes the climate. And so everyone that's involved in that, what they're used to, they're used to the climate that they live in. That includes us, but more importantly, includes the biosphere, the animals, the plants, or wherever the case may be. And so, yes, there is paper after paper after paper that has studied the impact on global warming. It's certainly not going to cause any cooling. There certainly is a greater dynamic of that more of the heating will take place towards the poles than it does through the equator. There's also that it increases more on land masses than it does at sea. Uh, the question in front of me right here is also, what would be a safe level of CO2 and why? What we're talking about, safe level is quite maybe the wrong term. What science wants to do, as far as I know, is to return to what the PPM levels of CO2 were before we started influencing the CO2. And so we're talking, I don't know, roughly, roughly around 300 parts per million, but that's because the world is used to. And the problem is we have, let's say, we're, look where we are right now. We're at 420 parts per million. We have over a degree Celsius as the global temperature gone up. Science's warning is that this is getting to a very serious level and things are going to get worse. And the problem is, let's say we stop CO2 emissions from the burning of fossil fuels tomorrow, all man-made CO2. It doesn't improve the situation. It doesn't improve the situation at all. What it does, it stops getting worse than it was before. And if we leave it up to nature to correct that, we're talking about centuries before it can happen. But so, yeah, so... If you look back in the historical record uh, as a geologist, it's, it's the geological history is a very key part of understanding the earth. And traditionally, geologists were the climate scientists before climate modelers hijacked the term a few decades ago. If we go back in time to 540 million years ago, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere were 15 times higher than they are now. And that's when corals and shellfish appeared on the earth. And in fact, that was the greatest expansion of life on earth occurred 540 million years ago, right when carbon dioxide levels were at its peak. If you go back in time to say the Carboniferous era, um, early Carboniferous era, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere were very high and life thrived on earth. There was tremendous life everywhere. And that's where our coal beds came from. There was all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Plants grew very quickly. They fell down into swamps, formed peat beds, which became our coal deposits. So the reason we have these coal deposits is due to the abundance of life hundreds of millions of years ago when carbon dioxide levels were much higher. So there's no indication that high levels of carbon dioxide are bad for life. The, the historical record over the last few hundred million years shows the exact opposite. Carbon dioxide is very beneficial for, but, uh, for, for life to, on Earth. To, to, yeah. to come in there, um, isn't there a level of CO2 that you would feel uncomfortable with that might even just become toxic? 
I mean, the submarines have toxic levels at one stage. You know? Well, you know, on a crowded train, carbon dioxide levels are about 5,000 parts per million. Um, it, it, obviously the air on trains isn't very good in a car. If you're traveling in a car with several other people, you get very high CO2 levels as well. Um, it can become toxic at some point, but we're nowhere near that level. And even if we burned all the fossil fuels on earth, we would get nowhere near that level. And when you exhale out of your lungs, you're exhaling 40,000 parts per million carbon dioxide. So half the time our lungs have carbon dioxide levels a hundred times higher than ambient in them. It's not killing us. It's just carbon dioxide is a key part of life. That's interesting, Tony, because a, a good point. Uh, I've never actually seen weather change in the plane from us breathing into it. So I have to agree with you that it's not an issue on an airplane. Uh, I also, uh, I will give climate deniers, I don't give in on too many things, but this one I will that uh, anthropogenic global warming did not occur during the time of the dinosaurs. And it's great that you can describe that all these situations happened hundreds of millions of years ago, but there was no human beings around then. Most of the plants we have now weren't around then. Most of the animals we didn't have around then. What we've done is we've evolved in the climate that we have today. So it's interesting to look back to see what happened in the past and where does that most of that information come from? It's people that have published in the peer reviewed literature, not because they wrote a blog, even though there's a few graphs that circulate that people call graphs they are actually cartoons. But beside that, the information that you generally say is true. That's just another straw man discussion. We are talking about what happened on this planet in the last hundred years. We're not talking about the massive CO2 that was in the past or that changes in the earth temperature because of changes in, in the earth's tilt and things like that. We are talking about what happened in the last 100, 150 years. To a certain extent, it's virtually irrelevant. Um, yeah. I just want to come in here. Can we just sort of, I think it's a clarity for the audience. Um, global warming or climate change, we're basically talking about the same thing. We're talking about the earth getting warmer due to CO2. That's the official theory. Water vapor will go up, it will increase, you know, the forcing. And climate change, of course, is the consequence of the heating. I suppose that is the dumbed down version of it, just for some people it's, in the audience. It's actually a good question because it is a little bit confusing. You know, I think Tony and I have argued over this. People will say, well, they just, scientists just changed the terminology from, from, from global warming to climate change because they want to make it sound worse for people. Uh, that's not the way it happened. What happened was is that climate change and global warming is, as terms, they both really evolved in the 1970s. And really one is a subset of the other. Global warming is the direct effect of the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect is really what's starting this all off. And so with the, with the emission of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we do get global warming. And so the temperature itself, yes, heat episodes can cause problems, but that's just the tip of the iceberg when you talk about global warming. The melting of the ice caps is also could be very important. But what's worse is what it does to the climate. So global, global warming is a subset of climate change and climate change is a more inclusive uh, title word to use because it also includes, as we're talking about here today, the extreme weather events. I'm right, just, just looking at this question from Chris, um, whatever happened to the medieval warm period? That That's really good. That's an excellent question. Um, in the 1990, IPCC report, they showed very strong medieval warm period, very strong little ice age. They showed that um, temperatures increased coming out of the 18th century up until about 1940. And then they started to decrease again after 1940. And this was very similar to what Breffa and Jones temperature reconstruction um, looked like in 1998. Um, clarity, you're talking about the hockey stick there. No. Well, no, Griffin okay. Jones. So there, were the IP in 1998, the IPCC was considering two different reconstructions. One was by Griffin Jones, which showed um, a little ice age. It, it showed um, a very strong warming going into about 1940, and then a lot of cooling after the 1940s. 
Um, and so the, there was a hot debate going on inside the IPCC to go with Breffa's temperature reconstruction or Michael Mann's hockey stick. And it's well documented in climate gate emails that this argument that was going on and that Michael Mann's hockey stick was a favorite among policymakers as Breffa described it. And that's why it ended up getting picked um, by the IPCC to go with the hockey stick rather than Breffa's reconstruction, which was similar to the 1990 um, IPCC report because the policymakers wanted it that way. So that's an excellent question. Thank you. Well, again, Tony likes his conspiracy theories. I think this is the fifth or sixth one we heard today. Yeah, that, wait, 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 wait. That's, that's not my conspiracy theory. Yeah, it's your this conspiracy is, this is theory, this is what, Tony. This is what uh, Keith That, that Keith people use, the, use legally hacked emails as being some sort of, of, oh, here are the facts that happen within the secret but all the general ECC. On, on the hockey stick, I mean, I've, I've read some of the emails, but more to the point, the... the the critique, as I understand it, and I've messaged uh, Stephen McIntyre, who uncovered um, this thing. Um, the critique has been that Michael Mann, so that they, picked, they, they cherry picked tree ring data that confirmed the narrative. The other critique has been, which is more significant, which is never mentioned, is that the principal component analysis that they use, the noise reduction, for those who are not familiar with the term, um, would always give you a hockey stick regardless of what data you put into it. So the algorithm itself spews out the hockey stick. That was the major critique against it. And when I reevaluated using my engineering data background, and I am, can do principal component analysis, I find the same thing that they found. So that does not negate the entire global warming story, just to be clear on that. Okay, But the critique against the hockey stick is that the principal component analysis in particular makes no sense for hockey stick reconstructions. Well, it may not make sense to you. It does make sense to the greater climate science community, which is, is, is you talk about the, the pioneering work of Dr. Mann, who's an award-winning scientist, an honored member of the National Academy of Sciences, which is a prestigious group in the United States. It's not just his graph. This has been reproduced a half dozen times this is accepted science. Using can, the same methodology that is still critique still stands again. People, that is the people point. People can say anything they want. If you can disprove what any of these graphs have shown, put it up to scrutiny and put it out there. Mackin, the one thing everyone, especially on the climate deniers side, about so-called climate gate, there was a serious conspiracy that was going on. And it wasn't by the scientist. It's how this hacking of a university website just happened to happen just before the important Copenhagen conference took place. This was a criminal event, but it caused a stir. There must have been seven or eight international investigations into those emails official ones, both by the British government and by the US government and various officials. Every single one found no wrongdoing on the part of the scientists. So I don't need somebody who's biased to say, oh, look at what these evil scientists were doing. They, they, they were trying to be corrupt and they were trying to fake the information. I can assure you gentlemen that that is a pure conspiracy theory that the official investigations totally disagree with. Well, I, I'm not so there, so sure if they disagreed with that, to be honest. Um, British yes. government might have a, a bit more light on it. But in the US, they came to the conclusion that the hockey stick could not give confidence for the entire period of the warming. And that's in the official record. Okay. That has been ignored by the media in particular. I don't know why. I don't make up things that I'm not involved in. I, I don't like the word conspiracy because I think um, bias explains a lot more to me. But I, I just want to say, if I read the official records, what I've done onto it, and it's also on the Climate Audit website by Stephen McIntyre, he shows quite clearly what's going on. And uh, Professor Muller, I think, at the University of California, if I'm not mistaken, also came to the same conclusion. And that's why he set up the Berkeley Earth Project. And just for the record, that shows warming. He agrees with the warming. He just doesn't agree with the hockey stick. So it, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things that I, I find very strange. I mean, disproving the hockey stick doesn't disprove climate change, if you will.
and I find it strange that people look at a climate denier website for information about climate science. McIntyre is not a climate scientist, not a climate scientist in the least. And again, I go back to the same thing. It is easy to put forward accusations against people, but put your work out there for scrutiny. Don't put it on a blog. Don't put it on a YouTube. If you have something, put it out and see if you can get past the process that science is based on these days. And that's on that peer review process. I can, you can look at Google forever. You can look through the peer reviewed literature. There is the modern science of climate change has been going on since the mid 1950s. The evidence is clear. It is all supported the science that we've been talking about earlier on. There is no evidence out there, zero, that's ever supported that the, the temperature profiles that the, we are causing climate change, that's a serious threat out there. There is literally, there must be 100,000 papers that support it. So the, the, if you look at the climate gate emails, there's very clear evidence of misbehavior um, by the participants. And, the, and they were quite open about it at the time. Uh, Phil Jones acknowledging that things he done was wrong. There's never any indication that those emails were hacked. It's more likely they were released by a whistleblower. Um, and there's never been any indication that they were incorrect, that they're, they're, they're legitimate um, emails that were passed back and forth between climate scientists, and they showed misbehavior. There's tremendous evidence of a medieval warm period. It's well known that glaciers in the Rocky Mountains and the Alps were either very small or non-existent during the medieval warm period. Um, in the southwestern United States, where I grew up um, in New Mexico, the, the Anasazi, um, who, who dominated the southwest um, culture for centuries, went extinct during the 13th century during a 70-year-long drought which finally wiped them out. It's well known that there's were century long droughts in California, um, a thousand multi-century droughts in California going um, back around, around a thousand years ago. There, there's huge amounts of evidence that there was a very warm period with a lot of bad weather in some parts of the world during that time. And, that, and that's when um, Greenland was colonized by the Danes. And they farmed there and they, they lived a good lifestyle there for several hundred years before they all froze to death during the Little Ice Age. So there, there's huge amounts of evidence of a medieval warm period, which is contradictory to Michael Mann's hockey stick. Um, I think Briffa's reconstruction didn't go back that far, but it clearly showed the Little Ice Age. Uh, so th this was well, the middle warm, medieval warm period was very well documented climate science for a very long time until Michael Mann erased it with his one very shaky temperature reconstruction. You know, I'm sure Dr. Mann would be very impressed that he was all so powerful that he single-handedly wiped out the medieval warm period. And by the way, Tony, the, your, your cheap shots at the, at the climate gate emails, there is an actual police investigation that was undertaken about this. They were illegally hacked. It was no whistleblower. And so, yes, it was criminal activity that released those emails. But that aside, okay, you can believe what you want. It's up to the scientific community to decide whether, it's not that the medieval warm period didn't exist. The question about the medieval warm period is, was it a global event? And the general decision of the greater scientific community was no, it was not. The one thing, climate deniers love picking on Dr. Mann. Okay, they, they, I must see 20 tweets a day from one of the most respected climate scientists in the world. Let's pretend Dr. Mann doesn't exist and neither does his hockey stick graph. First of all, there must be at least six more reconstructions that have nothing to do with Dr. Mann that has shown very similar effects. So just harping about this great scientist all the time is uh, somehow he's an evil genius that's undermined the whole scientific community. It's certainly absurd. Let's just count it as, is that number seven or number eight conspiracy theory today, Tony? I'm losing count right now. 
So, um, so first, first of all, Mike, Michael Mann is a geologist, just like myself. You describe him as a climate scientist. He has the same background I do, except I have an engineering degree as well. Um, he, the, the, there is tremendous evidence from all over the world that the medieval warm period, um, of a medieval warm period in many places, like I mentioned earlier, like this, the small size of glaciers. Um, but if we go back further than that, we can go back to 5,000 years ago when carbon dioxide levels were much lower, the Arctic was ice free around the time Stonehenge was built. There were trees, there's, you can find fossil trees going all the way up to the coastline, the Arctic coastline in Canada from 5,000 years ago, where now the tree line is 80 kilometers further south. This occurred with carbon dioxide levels much lower than they are now. So the, so the claims that carbon dioxide control the climate are not backed up by the historical record. Um, Richard Feynman said, if your theory doesn't, if experiment doesn't agree with your theory, your theory is wrong. And we have hundreds of millions of years of Earth history showing much higher carbon dioxide levels, and which show that a lot of the claims being made by climate alarmists are not correct. Life thrives at higher CO2 levels. There's been tremendous variation in climate at higher CO2 levels and at lower CO2 levels than there is now. There's no indication. In, in 1901, Newt Angstrom, Nobel laureate Newt, Newt Angstrom, showed that um, Arrhenius' theory about global warming was incorrect. He demonstrated experimentally that you can vary the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by a tremendous amount, and it has very little impact on the Earth's radiative balance. And the reason being that the air is already opaque to the spectral bands of carbon dioxide. It's, and it, adding more carbon dioxide doesn't change things very much. It's like, it's like if you put a window shade up that blocks 99% of the light, adding a second window shade makes very little difference. And that's exactly what's going on. The, the first couple hundred parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere make the atmosphere almost completely opaque to the spectral bands of carbon dioxide. And that's why increasing carbon dioxide levels make little difference. As I said, Newt Angstrom showed this in 1901. The United States Department of Agriculture published a document in 1941 showing the same thing. In 1971, Stephen Schneider and Rasul at, at NASA published a paper saying exactly the same thing. Stephen Schneider later, later switched his position and went on to become a climate alarmist. But in 1971, he showed why increasing levels of carbon dioxide do not have a strong effect on the Earth's radiative balance. I've worked for the National Center on Atmospheric Research on their radiative transfer model. They hired me to do software development on it. I'm very familiar with how they work. And you can see that most of the greenhouse effect from carbon dioxide is in the first 100 or 200 parts per million. Once you go beyond that, the additional impact of, addition, of more carbon dioxide is very small. And this is well understood. Even Dr. Hansen understood this. And that's why he came up with his feedback theory. He, he knew that the first order effect of more carbon dioxide was small. So he came up with this feedback theory that when you get more carbon dioxide, the earth warms and this causes the Arctic to melt. And then you get less albedo in the Arctic and that causes further warming. And eventually you heat up out of control and become like Venus. But the historical record shows that my, that, that Dr. Hansen's theories were incorrect. But, uh, Tony, just to, to clarify, they, um, some people have criticized that and saying, yes, CO2 saturates on a closed experiment, but in an open atmosphere, it will pull up into higher layers. And essentially, each layer will become saturated So because the, um, the Earth also loses radiation to space. So they, the argument there is that, yes, it does saturate, but it will saturate you know, in different layers. What do you say to that? Yeah, but, the, but, but that effect gets smaller and smaller as carbon dioxide increases. And as Greg Bank has pointed out, the spectrum of water vapor and CO2 overlap. Um, most of the, of the spectrum of CO2, which are very narrow bands, overlap with the much wider bands of carbon of water vapor, yeah. which, uh, which is much more abundant in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. So that's another reason why increased carbon dioxide has very little impact on the climate. 
Tony, I just want to follow up and you saying that, you, that Dr. Mann has the same degree that you do. I was, I actually didn't know that Dr. Mann only had a, a BSc in geology. I thought he had a lot more than that, but that's what you stated. So uh, we'll let it go for now. You talk about carbon dioxide in the past and in those cases, CO2 was quite high and it didn't correlate with temperature. Where does that information come from? It came from clients, climate scientists in the peer reviewed literature. And so it's kind of scientists that discovered this. Climate scientists have known for decades that in the past CO2 was not the driver of, of climate change. So that, you, that people bring this out as some sort of revelation is, is meaningless. This is well known. We're again, we're talking about, that's why it's so special about what we're having today. CO2 is not only the driver of climate change today, it's CO2 being caused by us. You, you talked about the uh, experiments of Angstrom, and you're absolutely right. And the 1941 article by the, I think it was the Department of Agriculture, just supported what Angstrom had said. And that's because it was believed exactly what happened. If you had studied the science further, especially the peer reviewed literature, you will find out that in 1953 and 1956, Gilbert Plass showed that that was not true. And there is no scientist today that supports what Angstrom concluded. And so it's totally misleading to take an article that came out 120 years ago and you say, yeah, but are you saying science made a mistake? The special thing about science is that it is self-correcting. When something comes out like what happened with Angstrom and future work finds that there was a mistake made and it should be changed, science corrects itself. Um, uh, I want to turn the next phrase sort of into a question as we're coming for landing the last 10 minutes. Um, this has um, got to do with policy. Now, Tony mentioned this early on fossil fuel policies um, and things of that sort, but there does seem to be, at least, you know, an outsider would say a lot of opportunism. Um, the amount of money going into this in fossil fuels, in renewable energies. I work in the renewable sector for what it's worth. Um, you know, energy sector is a trillion of dollar, trillion dollar industry. And there's a lot of political opportunism that come with it. So sort of directed at Tony and then get Gerald's response to it afterwards. In, you know, in... Uh, oh, okay. No, it's Tony, it's your Tony. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so just going back to the previous point, in, in um, Dr. David Deming at the University of Oklahoma testified before Congress um, a few years ago that um, he received a communication from a prominent member of the climate science community around the year 1995 that we have to get rid of the medieval warm period. He testified to this under oath at the U.S. Senate. So th there clearly was this effort to get rid of the medieval warm period, and that's exactly what happened. They, uh, the IPCC chose chose Michael Mann's hockey stick over Breffa's temperature reconstruction, which showed the exact opposite. And Breffa quite clearly articulated that that this was that that Michael Mann's reconstruction was the favorite of policymakers. So Gerald keeps talking about science is driven by science, but it, the IPCC process is largely driven by policy. Um, Chris Lanzi at the National Hurricane Center resigned from the IPCC, I think around 2007, because it was being interfered with by Kevin Trenberth, who had no background in hurricanes research, never published a paper about hurricane research, but he was controlling the hurricane discussion and keeping Chris Lanzi from presenting accurate information about hurricanes. So to present the IPCC as being a um, scientific process, it's largely driven by politicians and it's policymakers. It's the name of the organization is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's a political organization pushing political goals. And, this, and the so-called science driven by this is largely driven by that politics. And most of the stuff which Gerald posts on about climate 
alarmism is from government websites. Once again, this is government. And this is exactly what Eisenhower warned about in 1961, is that research was being taken over by government, which made it inherently political. Oh, boy. I think we're up to 15 on the conspiracy theory. Tony, I don't know how to respond to that. You're, you're, you're simply making statements that don't aren't reflected in the scientific reality. Are all scientists perfect human beings? No, they're not. They're like you and I and the rest of us here. And a few of them are probably corrupt and a few of them are probably saints and most of them are in between. <laughs> but when you have tens of thousands of climate scientists in the scientific community, there's no way they're corrupt. And just because somebody works for a so-called government organization, if you think that the scientists at NASA and NOAA and wherever they're working are simply doing what their government masters tell them makes no sense. Like Jim Hansen was from, from NASA. And so there's lots of well-known scientists that go on. They don't follow their masters as it goes on. You are a little bit right about the IPCC. The, the final reports, especially the synthesis report, have been edited by the government appointees, usually bureaucrats, for the IPCC process. The reports themselves are written by the leading climate scientists in the world and undergo a strict scrutiny. It's the job of the IPCC chairman to protect that science from any direct government interference. And so there may be a slight toning down of words. You know, you're probably familiar as, as I am of the word debates over adjectives that go into the final report. But the basic science is still valid. And anything that appears in those summaries, there is, it's all backed up by peer reviewed literature. The IPCC doesn't make up any science. They don't do science. They do reviews of the scientific literature. Why don't climate deniers like the IPCC because it disagrees with them. They disagree with everybody that doesn't agree with them. Again, as I said before, they must be corrupt because they don't give them the answer that they don't want to hear. But uh, Gerald, I want to sort of just chime in there, but um, would you say there's a difference between what the politicians and the activists are saying and what is actually in the scientific section of the report? Because as you know probably better than I do, the report goes off, gets reduced before it gets to the summary statement for policymakers. There are those three groups that you mentioned. There's the scientists, and face it, if you read the science reports, they're very dull to most people. Why? Because they're very science-y. Okay, there's lots of jargon, there's lots of scientific stuff. Boy, that's hard for people to take. There are a few scientists who are act activists, but activists are out there. They're, they're so frustrated that so little action has been done they scream bloody murder that what's wrong with you people do something. Their heart's in the right, right spot because there is a serious drawback between the gap between what politicians are doing in the world and what the scientists are suggesting they should be doing. The politicians are way behind. And so the activists are trying to force people and force the politicians to come closer together. Does that answer your question? Yes, and I, I guess there's another one. Yes, some people are alleging that you have a conflict of interest. And this is a bit annoying because <laughs> I don't think it's uh, it's about that, to be honest. I mean, I'm conflicted as well, you know. All I can tell you is that I get this a thousand times a day, and it, it goes back to what I was saying. When people disagree with climate deniers, they accuse them of being corrupt. They'll accuse me of being corrupt. They would accuse Tony of being corrupt if he switched. They do it for the IPCC, they do it to NASA, they do it to NOAA. It's ridiculous as things go along. And so when you don't like the message, what do you do? You shoot the messenger. So any response to that? And um, then I guess we go into closing statements. Yeah. Um, the, the, there's no evidence that we're facing a climate crisis. 
Um, tropical cyclone frequency has not changed. Hurricane frequency has declined. Severe tornadoes have declined. Heat waves in the United States have declined sharply over the last 90 years. The worst floods in history occurred a long time ago. Um, where Where is this climate crisis? The human condition is improving. Um, life expectancy is at a record high. Crop yields are at a record high. We keep hearing these claims from climate alarmists that we're, we're having this terrible climate emergency that's killing millions of people, and the data shows the exact opposite. There's no evidence we're having a climate emergency. But you could go back to, say, the 1930s when we had the Dust Bowl, millions of people there was a global heat wave. There was a global drought in, the 19, in 1934, which caused tremendous problems around the world. Millions of people had to flee the Midwest and moved out to California, which was what the story of what John Steinbeck's story, The Grapes of Wrath, was about. It was about this horrible climate crisis we had in the year 1934 when carbon dioxide levels were low. People didn't need to rely on fake statistics or alarmist stories from CNN repeated over and over again. It was obvious there was a climate crisis in 1934 because 80% of the United States was in severe drought. Millions of people had to flee their homes and move. But now the current belief in that there's a climate crisis is based largely on repetition from cable news organizations, repeating the same story over and over again, make, showing people who were homes were destroyed by a flood or a hurricane, repeating it over and over again and trying to make people feel like this immediately affects them and, and, and it's a threat to their future. Forest fires in the United States, burn acreage is down 80% since the 1930s. But you never hear that statistic from the press. You, we, all we hear over again is that forest fires are getting worse when it's not true. The exact opposite has been occurring over the last 90 years. So I don't see any evidence of a climate crisis. All that I see is hysteria from the press. I see claims that this is supported by science. But when you look at these statistics, they don't support climate alarmism. On that sort of comment, what Tony sees or what I see doesn't matter. That's the challenge that climate brings. It's very hard to see the climate, but the, the, Tony doesn't see the floods that happened in Pakistan, that the bushfires that happened in Australia, uh, the giant heat dome that was over the Northwest US and BC last year that caused all the destruction. Those are facts. And more than that, science knows that climate change played a role in those facts. What the argument that our personal opinion about this is, whether it's mine or Tony's or yours or anyone else's out there, it doesn't matter. The facts are overwhelming. Now, attribution studies, for example, have been out for like 15 years of showing the contribution of climate change to various events. To say that global warming does not increase the severity or the frequency of extreme weather events doesn't make any sense. I don't care what a newspaper report said from the 1930s. That's not what science works. That is not scientific evidence, is not a scientific publication. We're talking about global events, not an event that happened preferentially in the US. It's not called American war warming, it's called global warming. It's important that we deal with what we know, not what we want to hear. And so often from climate deniers, they just give us what they want us to hear. Okay, um, well, um, I don't know if you, if you want the last few seconds, Tony, because I want to close this. It's going to be too long now. Yeah, so, so Canada's worst forest fire occurred in the year 18, 1825. Um, much of New Brunswick burned up um, in about 24 hours. Uh, it was by far Canada's worst forest fire. In 1851, most of the state of Victoria and Australia burned in just a few hours. Um, in 1871 was the worst forest fires in U.S. history up in the um, Great Lakes region. Chicago burned to the ground on October um, 8th, 1871. At the same time, there are massive forest fires all around the Great Lakes. Thousands of people burned to death in Peshtigo, Wisconsin. 
the probably the largest forest fire uh, in U.S. history occurred in the year 1910 and burned much of Idaho and Montana burned in just a few hours. Um, there was tremendous forest fire in February 1898, which burned three million acres in South Carolina in just a few hours in February. If you if you all of these things. The worst heat waves in U.S. history occurred in 1936. Gerald describes events which occurred recently as if there's something new, but these are things that have been going on forever. There's nothing new about them. The deadliest Atlantic hurricane um, occurred in the in the year 1780, and mo and one third of the deadliest 25 Atlantic hurricanes occurred around the time of the Revolutionary War. So you, you can look at these events now and say it's, it didn't ever happen before, it doesn't happen again. But as a climate historian, I know that they've happened in the past. They were just as severe or worse in the past when carbon dioxide levels were much lower. So these claims that carbon dioxide is making weather more extreme are simply not supported by the historical record. Okay, um, Gerald, I'll give you like a last few seconds to respond to that. And then that's really the, the last comment okay. of the evening. This is really great. Sounds good. No one has ever stated that climate change created extreme weather. It doesn't mean that every single weather event has to be the world record that has ever taken place. The facts are clear. It, it increases the severity and frequency of extreme weather events. It puts people at risk. My last closing remark is if you have to call a source of science corrupt, then you've already lost the argument. Okay. Well, um, I would like to thank both of you gentlemen for this debate. I see a lot of people in the audience enjoyed it. And uh, also thanks to the audience for keeping the chat respectable. It made my job easier. Okay. Um, can I can I make one more comment, Hugo? Uh, um, so it's a closing said, comment, yeah. Yeah, someone tweeted, uh, just tweeted, Tony, Gerald, great debate, very civil, with mutual respect. Censorship is a big loser. That was from James Phillips. Okay. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a great comment. So, yeah, thank you to both for this for this evening, and uh, highly appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hope, hope the audience enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you.